Hello, my name is Michael Barker. I'm a professor of civil and architectural engineering at the University of Wyoming. I am also one of the co-directors for the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance Bridge Technology Center. Today's video will be looking at the historical life cycle costs of steel and concrete girder bridges. This video was prepared for the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance, which is part of the Steel Market Development Institute under the American Iron and Steel Institute. The material presented in this video is for general information only and it is not a substitute for competent professional advice. So we will start this video with the question of why the life cycle cost study was performed. As we go out and talk to counties and states about steel bridges and short span steel bridges, the number one question that always comes up is, what about life cycle costs and life service of steel and concrete bridges? This is especially true for typical and short span bridge replacement projects. And the industry does not have a good answer. Both the steel and concrete industry advocates claim an advantage in life cycle costs, but it is only anecdotal information and that is not very convincing to counties and states when we are talking with them. So the objective of this study was to examine historical life service, which is defined here as performance and maintenance, and agency life cycle costs or the true agency cost for a bridge of steel and concrete bridges, there were additional questions of interest when this project was initiated. For instance, what about within concrete bridge types, whether they're box adjacent or box spread or the precast I-type beams? Or how about steel bridge construction techniques and coatings, galvanizing versus painting versus weathering steel? And another interest was how about deck system and rebar? whether it's jointless decks or the decks have joints in them, epoxy coated rebar, galvanized rebar, or black rebar. So the project started with life cycle cost data collection. And what's needed for a life cycle cost study over a range of bridges is a large comprehensive inventory of those bridges. And for each bridge in that data set, the required information would be the initial cost of the bridge when it was built and the date that it was built, all the maintenance that occurred on that bridge, the date and the costs, and of course the end of the service life for that bridge, or there needs to be an end of life model. So this figure at the bottom of the screen illustrates the required information to do a life cycle cost on a bridge, where when the bridge is built there needs to be an initial cost, and then as there's maintenance or contracts on that bridge during the time, the cost of that maintenance or contract is necessary, and of course the date of that maintenance or contract. And then at the end of the life of that bridge, that bridge is assumed to be replaced with an identical bridge that lasts the same amount of time. The issues that were encountered when trying to develop this bridge database was certainly on the data collection side. For each bridge, every cost and the date of those costs needed to be known. So the availability of the historical data was critical. And what was found was that in many circumstances, the owners just did not have the available data. They were missing costs or they were missing dates. And we'll see that as we go through the development of the database. And the other issue is that it does take a large amount of time and resources to collect the necessary data. So to develop the bridge database, many states and many counties were visited to see if they had the required data. Unfortunately, many did not. However, the Pennsylvania DOT did have fairly good records and they stepped up to the plate and they said, we will participate in this study. So the life cycle cost study presented in this video is based on a PennDOT database of bridges. The next several slides will deal with the development of that PennDOT database. There was a set of criteria that was developed to determine if individual bridges were accepted into the database. The criteria included the items listed on this slide. The study was interested in modern typical bridge structures. That included precast I-beam, box adjacent, box spread bridges for the concrete bridges, and steel rolled shape and welded plate girder bridges for the steel bridges. The modern era of bridges was defined as bridges built between 1960 and 2010. 1960 was determined as the date when modern techniques for steel bridge design and construction were implemented, and also the era where precast bridges became popular. 
Each bridge that made it into the database had to have complete and accurate department maintenance records, and the life cycle cost study considered any maintenance cost that was equal to or greater than 25 cents per square foot of deck area of the bridges. And of course, the bridges had to have known initial costs and the date of construction. When bridges had external contracts for maintenance or rehabilitation, those bridges had to have complete and accurate external contractor maintenance and rehabilitation records. And finally, since the life cycle cost study wanted to look at typical steel and concrete bridges, any bridge that had an initial cost greater than $500 per square foot or less than $100 per square foot was not included into the database. A final note on this slide is that the cost used in the life cycle cost analysis were the total recorded initial and maintenance costs in the PennDOT database. So if we look at the development of the PennDOT database that was used in the life cycle cost analyses, we start with all the bridges in the PennDOT inventory, which is a little bit over 25,000 bridges. The number of type bridges in the inventory, whether they're box adjacent or box spread or the steel types, was just under 8,500 bridges. Of those approximately 8,500 bridges, the number of types built between 1960 and 2010 came out to be 6,587 bridges. The table on this slide show the bridges in the PennDOT inventory that met all of the criteria. The title for this table is Table 8, Final Life Cycle Cost Database that Meets All Criteria. This is a table that comes from the Life Cycle Cost Report that is included on the shortspansteelbridges.org website that will be referenced later. So as we can see from this table, the steel rolled shapes, which are called steel I-beam, there are 82 bridges that met all the criteria. There were 230 steel I-girder plate girders, there were 400 precast adjacent box bridges, there were 581 precast spread box bridges, and there is 412 precast I-beam bridges for a total of 1705. The right column of this table shows the percentage of those that met all the criteria compared to the totals within the database that were built between 1960 and 2010. And as we can see, the bridges that met all of the criteria represent a little over 25% of those eligible. That result leads to the next two slides. This one's titled, Needed Notes on Limitations. Since the database contains only 25% of the eligible bridges built between 1960 and 2010, that means a large percentage of the bridges are not included and these bridges were not included in the database due to unknown dates and or unknown costs of department maintenance, or unknown dates and or unknown costs for contractor maintenance. Therefore, it needs to be recognized that the database is skewed a little bit towards bridges with lower amounts of maintenance. Another note on limitations is the systematic nature of the study. To develop an end-of-life model, the entire eligible bridges built between 1960 and 2010 were used to determine average deterioration rates. These average deterioration rates were based on condition ratings, and an end-of-life model was based on the deterioration rates. Another limitation is that this study does not predict any future maintenance. For instance, bridges built past 2000 may not have experienced maintenance yet. Therefore, the results, comparisons, and conclusions must be taken in context to the database and the database limitations. Since all of the bridges in the database are still in service, a bridge life model needed to be developed. It uses the average deterioration rates for the different bridge types over the total PennDOT inventory. The deterioration rate for the individual bridges was developed by starting with the 2014 condition rating, assuming it was a 9 the year it was built, and then dividing by 2014 minus the year it was built. Deterioration rates were developed for each individual bridge and then the averages were used for the different types of bridges. Table 9, average deterioration rates, shows the results. For instance, for a steel rolled beam bridge, the average deterioration rate is 7.11% of a condition rating per year. Once the average deterioration rates were developed for each bridge type, a remaining life model was developed by assuming that the bridge would be replaced when the condition rating became a 3. So the remaining life could be determined by saying it's going to be replaced at 3 
In 2014, it has a certain condition rating divided by the average deterioration rate. Then, of course, the bridge life could be determined by saying it's now 2014 minus the year built is how long it's lasted so far, and then add the remaining life. This slide shows how results are going to be shown in this video. When results are shown on a slide, there are going to be several items shown. One will be an arrow underneath the results that show which is the first ranked and which is the second ranked for the results of that table. Also, there may be comments that are positive to the steel industry, but then every one of them is going to have this statement down here that all are similar with none way out of balance, and we'll deal with that statement towards the end of this presentation. So the next couple slides show an example of a life cycle cost analysis, the analysis that was used in this study. We're going to look at an example bridge. It's a precast spread box beam bridge. It was built in 1969. It has three spans. It has a length of 176 feet. It has a deck area of 7621 square foot. In 2014, it had a superstructure condition rating of a 5. Using the average deterioration for a precast box being spread bridge of minus 7.988%, the remaining life of this bridge is predicted to be 25 years, which results in a total bridge life of 70 years. The top half of this slide shows the initial cost in the year the bridge was built. It also has the maintenance that was performed on the bridge and the cost and the years of that maintenance. It is necessary to bring them to a common time frame to consider inflation over the years. The year that was chosen for the life cycle cost study was the year 2014. However, the bridge was built in 1969, and of course we're looking at comparing bridges on an equal basis. So each bridge in the database had to be converted to an equivalent 2014 year. For instance, it is assumed that each bridge was built in the year 2014. So for this example bridge, 1969 was brought up to the year 2014, and that becomes year zero for this bridge. The first maintenance on this bridge occurred in 1988, which is 19 years after the bridge was built. So that represents year 19, assuming the bridge was built in 2014. The next maintenance occurred in 2009, which is 40 years after the bridge was built. So for each bridge in the database, it was assumed that it was built in 2014, and the dates of the maintenance that were performed on that bridge represents the years after 2014. The cost to build this bridge in 1969 was $141,475, or $18.56 per square foot. The equivalent cost to build that bridge in 2014 was estimated using the Engineering News Record Construction Cost Indices, where the cost in 2014 dollars to build that bridge is the cost in 1969 dollars times the construction cost indice of 2014 divided by the construction cost indice of 1969. And what we see down here is that in equivalent 2014 dollars, it would cost $143.45 per square foot, whereas it only cost $18.56 per square foot in 1969. The life cycle cost analysis also uses constant 2014 dollars. So each of the maintenance costs were also transformed into equivalent 2014 dollars. For instance, the first maintenance contract, which was a latex overlay, cost $58,401, or $7.66 per square foot, and that's equivalent to $16.63 per square foot in 2014 dollars. And then the life cycle cost analysis uses constant 2014 dollars for each bridge in the database. The figure on this slide shows the life cycle for this example bridge. That in 1969, which becomes year zero, or 2014, there was an initial cost. 19 years later, there was a contract. There was also one at 40 years, and there was also one at 44 years. And there's $2014 equivalent cost for each of the initial costs and the contract and maintenance costs. The present value cost for this bridge involves discounting future costs to a present value. This requires the use of a discount rate. The effective discount rate takes into consideration inflation and growth. The discount rate used in this life cycle cost study comes from the Office of Management and Budget, Circular A94, for the year 2011 and uses a 30-year discount rate of 2.3%. 
So the present value cost for this example bridge, for one cycle of that bridge, is equal to the initial cost plus that first maintenance discounted back 19 years, the second maintenance discounted back 40 years, and that third maintenance discounted back 44 years for a total of $154.49 per square foot. What this value represents is that if you had that amount in the bank today and you could expect an effective discount rate of 2.3%, you could pay for that bridge until the end of that bridge's cycle. That you would pay $143.45 to build the bridge, and the remaining money would be enough to pay that first maintenance at 19 years, the second maintenance at 40 years, and the amount would be exhausted when you pay the third maintenance at 44 years. However, an issue comes up when we start comparing one bridge to the next. If we have a bridge that lasts 70 years, and then we compare it to a bridge that lasts 40 years, one cycle of present value cost does not make an equivalent comparison. Therefore, to be able to compare bridges that last a different amount of time, perpetual present value cost was used. The perpetual present value cost assumes that the bridge is replaced with an identical bridge after the first cycle, and then after each cycle it is replaced with an identical bridge forever. For our example bridge, what that represents is that if you could sink $193.97 per square foot into the bank now and get an effective discount rate of 2.3%, you could build the first bridge and after 70 years replace it with another, and after 70 years replace it with another in perpetuity. By doing this with perpetual present value costs, any bridge with any lifespan can be compared to any other bridge. Perpetual present value cost is used in this life cycle cost study, but we could have used equivalent uniform annual cost, which is the same thing, but it was determined that it seemed easier to understand perpetual present value costs. This slide demonstrates for the steel plate girder bridge database, the data that was collected and the life cycle cost results. For each bridge in the database, the location, year, spans, length, area, geometry, materials were collected under general information. A file was produced for the maintenance and external contract work that was performed on the bridge, and a file was produced that included the initial and life cycle cost for that individual bridge. With the life cycle cost analyses completed for each individual bridge in the database, additional bridges were removed based on the perpetual present value costs. This is because this study wanted to look at typical bridges. The study did not want to allow outlier bridges to influence the results. So it was decided to keep bridges that had a perpetual present value cost within plus or minus one standard deviation of the overall average. It was thought that this would represent typical bridges over the bridge types. So the table on this slide shows the number of bridges in the life cycle cost study database that was used to draw conclusions. Out of 1,705 bridges that made it into the database, 1,186 had perpetual present value costs within plus or minus one standard deviation within each bridge type. Now that there was a qualified life cycle cost database that included bridges that met the criteria and were considered typical steel and concrete bridges, comparison of life cycle costs and future maintenance costs can be performed. This video will look at the items that are listed on this slide in blue. However, the Life Cycle Cost Reports considers all of these variables, and it can be found at www.shortspansteelbridges.org. This video will examine comparisons of bridge life, perpetual present value costs, perpetual present value costs based on bridge length, present value costs of future costs, and it will also have one slide on a comparison within steel bridges, which looks at curb versus straight, fracture critical bridges, and protection systems that include painted steel and weathering steel. Unfortunately, none of the bridges that made it in the database had galvanized steel girders. The first item to be examined will be bridge life, where the average bridge life is shown in the table for the different bridge types. Also shown in the table are the number of bridges in the final life cycle cost database and the average year built. As we can see, steel rolled beam bridges has the highest average bridge life at 81.3 years. The lowest is precast I-beams. The second highest is the precast box spread beam bridges. But of course, this statement down here, all are similar with none way out of balance, certainly holds true. 
However, a better way to look at this would be using the cumulative density function for each bridge type. Using the cumulative density function not only considers the average bridge life, but also considers the dispersion or the standard deviation within the data set. For instance, we consider 75 years to be the design life of a bridge. The CDF can give us the probability that a bridge lasts at least 75 years over the different bridge types. This plot shows that a steel rolled beam bridge has a 73% probability that a bridge will last at least 75 years. The concrete box spread beam bridge is next with a 65.6% chance of lasting at least 75 years. And on the low end, the precast I-beam bridge has a 44.3% chance of lasting at least 75 years. The results here not only consider the average bridge life, but also the standard deviation within that bridge type. This table shows the perpetual present value cost for all bridges in the database. It also has columns for the initial cost, the equivalent present value cost of all future costs, in addition to average length, average number of spans, average year built, and average life. We see that the precast I-beam bridge has the lowest perpetual present value cost of $217.50 per square foot. The second lowest is the steel rolled beam bridges. Now we do understand that length and number of spans does have an influence on perpetual present value costs, and those variables are examined within the full report at shortspansteelbridges.org, but is not considered here. However, our statement down here that says that all are similar with none way out of balance still holds true. We can use the cumulative density function again to ask the question of, Given a bridge type, what's the probability that bridge costs are less than $300? This considers not only the average perpetual present value cost, but also the standard deviation within those costs. We see for the precast I-beam, the probability that the cost would be less than $300 per square foot is 93%. The next highest is the steel rolled beam bridge at 88%. At the low end, we see that for a steel plate girder bridge, the probability that the costs are less than $300 per square foot is 66%. The Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance is interested in simple spans up to 140 feet. This slide shows bridges with lengths up to 140 feet. However, they may have more spans than just one. Out of the total database, there were 27 steel rolled beam bridges, 18 steel girder bridges, 240 box adjacent, 325 box spread, and 98 concrete I-beam bridges that had a maximum length of 140 feet. The table shows the perpetual present value costs, initial costs, future costs, average length, average number of spans, average year built, and average life for the bridges that had a maximum length of 140 feet. We see that the steel rolled beam bridges had the lowest perpetual present value cost of $266.24 per square foot. The next lowest was the precast I-beam bridges with $281.64 per square foot. Here we have steel plate girder bridges that comes in a little bit high, but a 140 foot length in a plate girder is not a common bridge. Again, we can make the statement that all are similar with none way out of balance. This slide examines the future costs incurred for the different bridge types. The table shows perpetual present value costs, initial costs, future costs, average life, and then the right column is perpetual present value costs divided by the initial cost. This ratio is used to indicate the impact from future costs and bridge life, since the perpetual present value cost is influenced by both the future costs and replacing the bridge after so many years. The lowest impact for future costs is for steel rolled beam bridges and steel plate girder bridges at about 1.2 to 1.21. The highest is for the precast I-beam bridge. But the small range shows that all are similar with none way out of balance. The last item to be examined is within the steel bridge database. It was an attempt to look at variables such as the protection type, whether it's weathering steel, painted or galvanized steel, whether the bridge was curved or straight, and whether the bridge was fracture critical or non-fracture critical. The analysis of the results are not covered within this video, but they are performed within the final report on shortspansteelbridges.org.
This slide is shown here to demonstrate that these type of variables can be considered within a life cycle cost analysis to determine impacts on life cycle costs. So getting back to the question of why the study, that bridge owners were asking questions on life cycle costs between steel and concrete bridges, and they were expecting the answer of which type is the best bridge. And we come back to the statement that was on all of our results slides. All are similar with none way out of balance. If we look at the overall weighted average perpetual present value cost, it comes out to $252.40 per square foot. Each bridge type average, whether it was concrete or steel, is within 14% of that weighted average. And if we consider the standard deviation range, which was between $48 and $65 per square foot, or a coefficient of variation between 20 and 25%, any one type bridge may be the most economical for a bridge project. If we look at the probability density functions, which represents the average and standard deviations for the perpetual present value cost for each bridge type, we see that there's not very much difference between the different bridge types. And given the averages and the standard deviations for each bridge type, any one type of bridge may be the most economical for a given bridge project. In other words, there is no one type of bridge that clearly beats the others. In summary, this video and the final report examines the initial costs, life cycle costs, and future costs of bridges in the PennDOT database. However, it does need to be stated that the database is limited to bridges that met the criteria, it is not as comprehensive as desired, and results must be taken in context of the database and the database limitations. However, from the database, I think it is clear that typical concrete and steel bridges are competitive on initial costs, future costs, life cycle costs, and bridge life. For any given bridge project, concrete or steel bridge types may be the most economical. And the takeaway from this study should be that owners should consider both steel and concrete alternatives for individual bridge projects. This slide is included in this presentation to show the possible benefits of life cycle cost analyses. For instance, this study looked at concrete and steel bridges and looked at different types of concrete and steel bridges. The database was limited, and with a more comprehensive database, more conclusive results could be determined. But there are other superstructure issues that could certainly benefit from a life cycle cost analysis. For instance, for deck rebar, epoxy coating rebar costs money, galvanizing rebar costs money, stainless is an expensive material. But life cycle cost studies could determine whether there is an overall economic benefit for galvanizing, epoxy coating, or using stainless over the current black rebar. Other topics for bridge decks would be joints versus jointless decks, integral abutments, and overlays. For steel beams and girders, protective systems would lend itself well to life cycle cost studies, comparing painting versus weathering steel versus galvanizing. Even maintenance programs could be subject to life cycle cost studies. Washing and clearing shrubbery away and touch-ups cost money, but a life cycle cost analysis could determine whether the cost of that maintenance delays future costs and results in overall economic benefits. Even service programs could benefit from life cycle cost analyses. For instance, in the winter, is salting, laying cinders, or laying sand more economically beneficial? And of course, there are many other variables that could be used in a life cycle cost analysis. So in closing, I certainly want to thank PennDOT professionals, especially Tom Maciosi, the bridge engineer, and Katie Shopman, a civil engineer, for their participation in the study. Gratitude also goes to the Steel Market Development Institute, the National Steel Bridge Alliance, and the American Galvanizers Association for supporting the work. The final report can be found at www.shortspansteelbridges.org. The opinions, findings, and conclusions in this work are not necessarily those of SMDI, NSBA, or the AGA. If you would like more information about the Life Cycle Cost Study, or about the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance, Rich Tavaletti is the director of the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance under the Steel Market Development Institute, and his contact information is shown here. If you would like to get a copy of the report, the website is shortspansteelbridges.org. I hope this has been helpful to you. Thank you.